Welcome back and thank you for tuning in to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio. This week, Akash and I have a guy called Chris Knott on the line, who is a PT based up in Manchester. And I have to say, massively caught me off guard. He has a huge, uh, huge broad knowledge across loads of different subjects. In this episode, we covered training periodization, we covered biomechanics, gut health, productivity, psychology. I mean, we we went in hard on this one. Um, so I really hope you guys enjoy. Well, how's it going, um, there, Chris? Yeah, very good. Thank you, mate. Yeah, really good. Training's all good? Yeah, yeah, training's good. I've got, uh, what am I up to now? I think I'm uh, seven, seven and a half weeks out from my first comp of the year. Um, things are steady, things are nice. Just, yeah. Just steady. How are you? Strong man. Oh, strong man. Okay. Yeah, yeah I saw you doing some uh, farmer's walks. Was it, uh, sorry, no, yoke, yoke carry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yoke carries. Yeah. Or the um, neck destroyer, as I like to call it. Yeah, it doesn't look very comfortable. <laughs> no. It's one of those where, like, you see it in the in the event, and it's, it's a decent event for me. But you see it, and you're like, okay, great, that's um, a good eight weeks of physio. And <laughs> <laughs> which uh, which which competition are you competing in? It is the Northern British um, qualifier for the Naturals division. Nice. Uh, so in strongman, there's a um, a Naturals division and then a strongman division. So oh, really? <laughs> they got a nat- they got a division now. I didn't know they had one. So it's um, it, the weird thing is, is it's not actually that lighter. It makes no sense. It's actually it's it's not that much. Um, it's just different people competing it. If you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like in powerlifting, they have the same weight classes, um, but you know the people are completely different, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I got that, and then I, I don't know if it's top three or top five. Go to Britain's, and then top five in Britain's go to Worlds. What weight class are you in? Under ninety. Well, what is your weight? Uh, this morning. It was 87.8. Okay. Are you looking to get up to the 90? No, or no, no. Uh, I, does it make a difference? I, yeah. I, I, it, it doesn't really... Um, when you get to the open weight, then yeah, it does become a good thing because you, you don't want to be giving up 5, 10 kilos on someone. But really, um, one thing that is different in my approach is I don't believe in heavier is better. In strongman, when you're in a weight category, leaner is better. Okay. Interesting. You've got more muscle and more fun. Yeah, 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 for sure. Interesting. Cool. Sounds good. I'm loving uh What's his name, by the way? This confuses the hell out of me. The guy that Ted. runs FLF. His <laughs> Instagram name is Ted. Yeah. Sometimes. Ran, Ran right? Yeah. yeah. Ray Hat, right? Okay. Sometimes I see Ted. And someone else is like Cash or Chash or Ch- something like that. You've got Chach, which is how he's known. It <laughs> was. Which, uh, Cash, right? No, he's just basically he's known as Uncle Chach or just Chach. Ted. <laughs> Um, Ted is a name from years gone by, and Rayhan is who we have to introduce him to new customers when they come through the door. Right. What's okay. his actual name? Or we call him Chat, or Lord Vector, as I like to call him. So um, <laughs> his stories are uh, hilarious. Yeah, yeah, they're out there. But he did, he knows what he's doing, and you know what? It, it's why I think. FLF is so refreshing is that we, yeah, yeah. you push the boundaries of you can't do that you can't say that in the fitness industry because like other other brands it's very like professional which it, which is it always should be like we are so so uh, honed in on customer service like you, you wouldn't believe but I think that's our USP is that it's we take what we do seriously but we don't yeah. take it what, what, what's good about you guys is, is it shows that you guys are having fun that's what it is yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not just a serious because that if you go if you walk into that gym, you're gonna think it's a real meathead serious gym, right? That's one of the best, well, best equipped places I've seen, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but if you've got that kind of personality in there, then it's gonna attract people who, who otherwise wouldn't really step through the doors, right? No, absolutely. It's disarming, which is the main thing. And think exactly, yeah. you, you go in, it's it's black and yellow. There's gangster rap playing twenty four seven, and it's just you oh, know, and, and you know, it, it's a, it's a heaven for guys like us who you know been training for a while, but you know. 90% of our demographic is general population. You yeah. know, and they're walking through the door and it's the great thing about it is that you do have females, you do have um, guys who you know, aren't as into the training, do have general population people coming through and they're as welcome, you know, the power lifters, the body. Yeah. And, and it also allows you, your staff to be more chilled as well. Like, so you guys are probably a lot more relaxed. The atmosphere, the banter is a lot more chilled yeah. out rather than having a super serious kind of atmosphere where you're scared to, scared to do anything, right? Yeah. Um, 
yeah, absolutely. That's been the feedback from trainers who have worked at um, other um, gyms. I'll just leave it there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they say the, the ethos that they can have sometimes is too professional and too robotic. Um, and like I said, you know, our, our main thing is customer service, but we, we do want to do it with our own unique twist. Yeah, well, it's working. Yeah, it's good. Well, what's your role? What's your exact role um, at FLF? I'm, you know, I am, I am just like a, a PT there, but you know, I, I think that uh, my mind works very, very similar to yours, Akash. Where I, I, I do really well, both of you actually, because of the content you produce. But I, I love writing, I love reading, and education things. So myself and James Largy have, have kind of put together this trainer education program, just due to the volume of actual further learning we've done. We just kind of felt that you know it's time to graduate and, and step up to that moment. Mm-hmm. So uh, give us give us the lowdown then for the listeners in here. So obviously Akash and I know you, yeah. but for the people listening, who's Chris not? Right. Okay. Oh god. Literally since Akash asked me this, I've been going through this since uh, Monday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think first thing I've got to say is that uh, I'm 28. For anyone who checks me Instagram and go, is he just qualified? Because I do have an incredible baby face. So people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Honestly, I thought you were like 22. <laughs> You're older or something than like that. You're older than Adam, right? Bless that, sir. You're older than Adam, then. Am I? Yeah, I'm 20, uh, 27. Yeah, I turned 28 uh, two weeks' time. Oh, the, the funniest thing that I had is that, you know, I'm a big Strongman fan, and um, Hapthor Bjornsson's 29, so he's a year. No old. way. So if I really? was to stand next to him, uh, <laughs> the difference between us. But yeah, anyway. Know, you see this guy, yeah? Yap Thor. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah, Thor. Um, Thor from Game of Thrones. He won the Arnold, didn't he, on the weekend? Yeah, he did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So yeah, I've been doing, um, this is my ninth year of being a personal trainer and um, done all the stuff that I think every personal trainer should do, which is worked in a commercial gym for three years, which is David Lloyd, then moved on to, um, the independent gyms, you know, the pop-up ones that you see, like kind of the, um, the Franco style bastardized ones. Can we swear on this one or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. I'm surprised I haven't beaten you to it yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's like the, you know the kind of the bastardized um, Defanco gyms that you see, um, and then you go from that comfort net of having such a like seven thousand people to pick from to then have to create your own um, kind of like feed of, of clientele. Um, so I've been doing that for five years in a self-employed basis, and really, it, when you get to that, it, it is a dog eat dog world, and you've got to kind of stand out in what is a saturated market. You know, I think um, Phil Lerny said it's not. It's not competitive, but it is saturated. So mm. from, you know, probably back in 2012, I started to write online and, and give myself like a voice and just be consistent with it. So, so yeah, I've, I've gone from, this is the uh, Frontline is the third facility I've worked on it in a um, self-employed basis. Um, but I've just all the way through from probably 2012 had a consistent like kind of passion for writing and getting, getting information out there. And, you know, I, I, uh, but the content that I put out now, which I'm really heavily focused on, I am a very content driven individual in on a free basis. I don't, you know, I don't think I'd ever would charge for like a, a membership system. Mm-hmm. Um, just out of love for it. Uh, you know, I'm very curious. I, I am very, very in love with what I do, but I do think that to get far in this industry, you have to evolve. You have to constantly think about your next step. You can't be a rep counter for too long. Cause otherwise, you know, you don't, I know with no disrespect to anybody out there, but you don't, this is, it is a young man's game, Peter. You know, you can't wake up at five o'clock and get home at 10 o'clock, five days a week, you know, later on in life. And I think it's for me seeing the wood through the trees and what I want to do and what I want to be in the future is why I've so much heavily invested time into educating myself and, and, and getting my name out there. You're doing all the right things. Your content's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is with the content, it's just what interests you. I think that, you could literally, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, what I'm into. It's like people who might be into CrossFit, they might be into core stability, they might be into kettlebells. The world's a big place. And, you know, if if you, if you just love what you do and read Mm. about it constantly, you'll appeal to somebody. Yeah. Just double down on one area, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like I I spoke about. Perfect. So what's your uh, biggest passion within fitness at the moment? Yeah. So, I, I, I tried to kind of hone in on one and something I said to Akash the other day is that what, something that's disarming for me is being like the jack of all trades, master of none. And I, I, I could say quite frequently is that, you know, when you've got somebody who, you know, you go up to the board on um, in a commercial gym and it'll say, 
Pilates instructor, postnatal, strength and conditioning, core training, and they have this huge list of everything that they've qualified. Um, I think the, there's that temptation that you think that saturating yourself with knowledge is actually better for what you want to do. And I think it's better to hone in on one thing. But in saying that, I'd say personally for me, I'd, what I'm confident at is um, structural analysis, so kind of biomechanics-ish, but more so like you know, figuring out what's wrong with people movement-wise and getting them to move better. Um, mm-hmm. It's definitely digestion and health in that sense and um, the mindset of everything. So I'd say the gut, the brain, and, and how people move. Um, and mainly that's just through personal interest. I think that, um, you know, I've come from a, a, an extremely poor lifting background in terms of I used to lift horrendously bad. Like, so again, we spoke about the form on, we used to be terrible on things and I've been injured before and, I'm, you know, I've lifted badly. I've come from a background of having very poor gut health, which needed to be fixed and working with professionals. Um, but I also do believe in like kind of the limitless theory is to think that we as people do massively underestimate what we're capable of. Um, and that when you apply yourself, you're strict with your time and your nutrition and, and your ethos, we can do so much more with ourselves than, than we can see. Yeah. Can awesome. you give us an example of how, uh, how you've, how, how you've found to kind of unlock your limitless ability? Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, you know, I put, I put a, um, an article up, um, recently, which is on, on productivity. And when I was, um, so my goal last year was to write a hundred thousand words of, of free online content, which worked yeah. out hundred articles at a thousand words obviously there's this easy some there's give or take some more or less so I just kind of thought right I've just got to look at my diary and I'd use certain nutritional tools certain supplements and I'm a big fan of binaural beats and I think that which is just like a, a something you can find on YouTube just type it into YouTube and um, it's like have a coffee sit down and just type and write and I think that you, when you just like you go into the gym and you train your legs, your legs get bigger. When you train a, a, a thought pattern or, 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 or kind of like, I don't know if they call it flow or whatever it is, where you, you when you're really in that zone, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Often it becomes easier to get into. And obviously, as someone, both of you are in creative writing, but you'll be familiar with this, Akash, where you kind of just the words are just coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that that's not something that necessarily happens. It's something just like going to the gym, it, it, it becomes easier the more you do it. How do you get yourself into the flow state? So, yeah, so it's um, find the most creative time of the day, which, uh, similar to you again, is, is the morning. Um, cut yourself off from the world, so get your headphones in, listen to something, whether it's meditation music or, like, the binaural beats. Um, have one thing in mind that you have, you know, you want to do. So don't just sit there and think, right, I'm going to do program design, or, right, I'm going to do article. Sit down and do an article that you want to do. Um, you you can use nootropics. Alpha GPC is a good one. I've used uh, Medanafil, if that's the right one. Um, I've used uh, different brain stacks, you know, sometimes coffee is the simplest one, high fat meals, intermittent fasting. These things work very well. Um, and you do, you, you do get shit done. It is, it is very powerful. But again, like, like your guys' message is, it's the consistency in doing it. It's yeah. not like you can not write and you've never written before. And if you were to put the headphones in and have a coffee, you're going to suddenly write 2,000 words in an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's practice of it. That's the thing. Do you, um, I was going to, so when you, when you, this is an interesting one, you know, when you listen to the music, do you ever try uh, repeating the same song over and over again? Oh yeah, no, these things run for like, is it the same one? Cause I have one, I have one piano song I listen to <laughs> on repeat when I write for the first, first two hours. I just, I just let it play continuously. Oh, really? No, I just, I just literally to go on YouTube and I'll, I'll find, um, ones that, um, you know, ones that I used before, and usually they run for about eight hours or, or three hours. And some of them, like, some of them are actually aren't even music. They're just tones. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they uh, designed to help with sleep? Yeah, they are. Binaural yeah. beats, yeah. Okay. I know it's a beats, yeah, but you might try this. You can change the frequency. So the frequency, I think 528 is something that, um, I nearly said resonates with me. That was such a bad pun. But no, it's, um, it's something that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's 528 works at like, it gets your brain into an alpha wave state or basically the focus one. So I don't know why I'm doing this in diagram because it's a podcast, but basically you've got one frequency here at say eight and then one frequency here at 12 and then your brain meets in the middle and does the frequency of 10. Now those are completely arbitrary numbers. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it basically because there's one frequency going in here and one here, your brain meets in the middle. It puts you into an out into the wave state that you want to be in. 
there's different wave states for the different types of feelings. So I think off the top of my head, it's beta waves. That might be wrong, or I'm not sure if that's 100% right. Is like that thought of, you know, if you're in the gym, you've got either heavy metal playing, you've had your pre-workout, you literally know you're about to lift a PB, you pick up a weight and it feels light when it's, you know, high intensity. That's the state of arousal, which you've got a certain frequency in your brain resonating. You don't want that whilst you're sleeping. You want something that's mm. further down the, um, the wave chain or whichever. So, you know, you say you implement this for productivity in the morning. Do you, have you ever tried this? Do you give this advice to your clients as well? Yeah, kind of. Well, it, it, it's, have you yeah, tried implementing it with other people? Or is it just kind of something you've kind of come across yourself? Yeah, I, I do. It depends on the person. I mean, I, one thing that I'll always say is that there's a big difference between theory and reality. And the, the, the theory of like this brain stimulation is fantastic. And yeah, I definitely work for it. But then you've got to look at someone's personality. Some yeah. people eat this up and go, yeah, that's amazing. I want to try it. And that's for me. And some people be like, what the fuck are you on about? And that's, um, and it's really got to look at who's it applicable for. Yeah. It's good you say that because um, I always talk to Adam about morning routine and stuff, but he's like, nah, it doesn't work for me, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I actually... Go- yeah, this was actually one of the questions that I'd got to that I'd written for the end of it was that you're big on productivity right now, yeah. um, which is something that Akash had nailed down and that I still suck at. Give me your three best tips. But you've kind of already, we've just yeah, saw yeah. Yeah. yeah, We've done that, so. Yeah, I mean. But I think Adam's also improving a lot because he's, find, he's finding his way of uh, what works for him, right? You're kind of slowly getting there, right? Yeah, yeah. I just... I, I just know that for me, it's like uh, I do. I need to train before I work, yeah. right? Whereas you like to do work before you train, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then I like to work until midday. I like to have like a gap around six, seven p.m. where I switch off, and then I work again in the evening. Yeah. So I get up, train first thing, like on a fresh mind. Then I get into the co-working space about nine thirty-ish. That's when I will start doing my work. Work up until about five. Head home for half five, and then I'll just chill, sort of between like 6 to 8 p.m. And then I work from 8 to like 11. Yeah, see, a lot of people find that training first thing really helps them, right? Yeah, yeah. it gets me going. I, yeah, yeah I've, I've tried what Akash does, which is getting up first thing, writing, and then I just, it just saps me with motivation to then go to the gym. I find it hard to switch between that, you know, everything being mentally taxing to then coming out of that and then, you know, giving myself that drive to then get to the gym i need to just get up gym straight away yeah, yeah. that then fires me up you know mentally but that, that highlights the point of what we're trying to say is that it's uh, everyone has their own mm. their own way right it's just about finding that uh, magic time and you're yeah 100 percent. And, and if you um if you ever get the chance if he's ever in europe or england or the uk again christian thibodeau's theories of neurotyping really make sense with this and um I'm a little bit ballsy where in the fact that if some, even in a room full of people of high established trainers, I didn't mind at that seminar, put my hand up and be like, okay, why? And expand on that. I think it's why I've got to like the stage of content where I'm now is that I, I kind of question everything. But what I'm trying to say is that um, by always asking why you can actually fall upon theories. And that's a very, very big term. That's a very thing. Something that I really want to stress a theory of why that might be. So if you think of it like this, um, First of all, I'd recommend an audio book or a book called um, Evolve Your Brain by Joe Dispenza. And I've, I have listened to a lot of um, neurology books and how the brain works. Um, that's probably my, my biggest area of research in 2017. But think of it like this. So as we spoke about the other day, you may have, Akash, you may have longer femurs, which make squatting a bad move for you. Adam, you might have shorter femurs, which makes squatting a good movement for you. So we're all quite familiar with the concept that, that lever lengths and individual biomechanics impact the way we squat, deadlift, press, and do pretty much everything. Now, that's not too dissimilar to regions of the brain, and some people can intricately have specific regions of the brain which may be slightly enlarged, may be slightly smaller, may be slightly sensitive, have more receptors, less receptors, on an intricate basis. And all these little idiosyncrasies make, it, make you um, different. But it's why you'll have somebody who has, uh, you know, is more creative in the morning. It's why somebody is better at maths and English. It's why someone's a visual learner and mm. uh, not an audio learner. And yeah, we can practice these things and make ourselves better at these key features. But this, for me, was a better way of understanding of why we're all different from a personality point of view. Is because we're actually anatomically different in our brains and the regions that have developed. It's interesting stuff, actually, isn't it? Yeah, it is. How did, you, how did you get interested? How did you get interested in reading more about this stuff? 
Um, yeah, it was just it was a thought process, really. I mean, it was quite funny because when we went to, when we did Thibodeau's seminar last year, we were driving down, and um, it was uh, we had we had no idea what he was on. There were seven of us cramped up in, in in James's car driving down, and everyone was like, "So what's it on?" And 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 I booked it for everybody, <laughs> and that said, "Right, we're going. He's, he's in England. We're doing it." And we're like, uh, "I said I got no idea." And then we turned up and he said, right, this is going to be two days of, of, of neurotyping neurology. And <laughs> it was brilliant. He's a fantastic speaker. He's incredible. Yeah, yeah, he's very good. Yeah. I, I really, really rate him. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I did, I did put my hand up and I was like, why? You know, go on. Why are you saying that? You know, how, do you, how can you? And his parents both are psychiatrists. So they kind of, um, so they, so he explained it through that and ex- observing them. So did that seminar he recommended the Cloninger Cloninger book I bought that book it was too advanced for me I didn't really read it that much and um, so I was like right let's look at some of the people who've inspired that got the audio books and then when I say productivity productivity and time management are very much the same thing so for example if you're driving to work and you've got a 45 minute commute or you, you commute in, in any any format you know if you've got dead time which could be listening to the radio or, or pissing around on your phone you know you can listen to a book and the way I saw it is that I go on Audible, right, this book is um, seven hours long. My trip to work is half an hour. Um, it's, so in a week, I can get through this book. And I did that with a series of brain books, mm. listen to them, absorb it, and just kind of stem my own theories based on those. And this is what they kind of the. And again, what, the reason why I use theories is that if I was to sit down with a neurologist, I'm completely fine with them turning around and going, no, Chris, you're completely wrong. That's not how it works. But it's just what makes sense to me at this moment in time and correlates to you know the, the experience I have with clients and basically what other people are saying. That's cool stuff. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Let's, um, let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about exercise. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> this is what this is about after all. Um, so we all know that, and, and we've repeated this message, you know, uh, across our podcast many times that changing exercises too frequently or the first sign of a plateau is, you know, more than likely a mistake. Um, as you just, you don't double down and, you know, get that movement pattern uh, going. So give us your three best, most simple ways for your clients to break through strength plateaus. Um, right, so strength plateaus, you've got to identify what whether it is a strength plateau. Because if you're working with, um, you've got to, first of all, you've got to identify if it's an athlete or a client who's like your, your average um, office worker who just wants to get stronger. Identifying that, and I'm taking it, you're talking about the general pop and not an athlete, uh, the, the two completely different components. Because um, a powerlifter who's been training for 10 years, who hits a plateau, and somebody who may not have improved the bench press who works in an office for two weeks, that those two could be termed as plateaus, but they're completely different approaches. Um, if you've hit a, pl- a plateau, the number one thing is assessment of form. Are you, well, actually, let's, let's look at the goal. Are you lifting for muscle mass or are you lifting for strength? Because in my opinion, they're two completely different things. Um, you know, which one is it? If a guy comes into me and says, I want a bigger bench press, I'll look at his, you know, his arm mechanics, his shoulder mechanics, and um, you know, how he's lifting. That doesn't really happen that often. But if you say, I want a big chest, I said, well, you're probably not going to do any bench press. So you've got to look at what's the actual outcome. If it's a strength one completely, the first one to look at is form and efficiency. So are they moving the bar from A to B as efficiently as possible? Which is actually for muscle production, the opposite of what you want to look at. You want to look at is the most maximum tension on the muscle. So again, I know I've kind of cross-referencing, but if we're just purely talking about getting someone stronger, the first one is um, definitely got to be the, the, the form. And I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, in, not in turn, but I've done courses and seminars with some of the strongest people ever, and they've all said the same thing. Technique form is is essential it's number one number two would be um would definitely so just on that note let's just go with a let's go with someone who um let's just take the bench rest for example yeah. what three kind of cues do you give most common one of the three most common cues you give to the bench press that helps a, a client uh, maximize their form okay right well first of all i'll say something which is which is funny which you guys are probably you'll raise an eyebrow is i've never benched more than 100 kilos in my life 
So um, I use the bench press as an example. I literally, my bench press one, I can, I can get more over my head than I can in bench press because really, I, yeah, I train, I train overhead because it's a strong man movement. If I want to change my chest, I use dumbbells. I, I, okay. I, let's say let's, any pressing then. Let's go with any chest pressing. Any chest pressing. What three key tips would you go for? Oh, oh, of- but, but for what Akash? For size yeah. or strength? Because Chris is saying these are two completely different things. So, you know, 90% of our listeners here, are uh, one of right? Yeah, but it still comes down to to the end goal, right? Okay, okay, let's go with body composition then. Yeah, well, this is what I was about to get at, is yeah. our demographic uh, after increasing yeah. body composition, right? Improving that. Whereas Chris is coming from more of a strength background. So so how are we pitching it to Chris? Okay, let's go with, let's go with body composition. <laughs> there we go, okay. <laughs> so, okay, if you fit a plateau in, say, like a dumbbell chest press, um, again, you've got to look at um, overloading the same form, so it's replication of form. So, for example, is it the same tempo as you did last week? Are you doing it to the same level? Are you doing it to the active range of motion? Um, because you know PBs can be bullshit PBs if if you're not doing you know if it's not replicable replicable technique. Now, for somebody who um, when I'm training a guy for body composition, he's training his chest. The only thing I'm bothered about is how well he can contract his chest. The weights in his hands are, are great and it's a form, you know, it's great when those numbers go up. But if I'm not, you know, I will be, you know, right in there. And if I'm not feeling that him actually move any contraction and there's nothing going on, you've got to reassess the actual angle of the movement, whether it's applicable for him, whether he needs to do pre um, prehab to change the sh- position of the shoulder girdle so he can get a better scapular retraction. You've got to look at all these things. And it's something I actually taught at Frontline in the seminar recently is that, People usually neglect remedial work because it's boring and it's not um, it's not sexy. You know, no one asks you what you can externally rotate for reps. But you've sometimes got to see the wood through the trees in what exercises can you do that potentiate your ability to lift more in other exercises. Um, so that's I know I've got off on a tangent there, but yeah, you're basically you've, it's a consistency in your form. It's doing the you know it's doing the same thing, and like we spoke about, Akash, it's earning the right to increase the weight um when i when i do um i i did a bodybuilding phase well as for my assistance work i did a bodybuilding phase uh, for eight weeks after uh, the turn of the year and you know you'll laugh and i don't mind saying this i don't know like no ego whatsoever but when i was doing chest press it was the bench was at 45 degrees and i'm using 22 20 24 kilo weight mm. and you know, well, you've got someone like Oscar who has to strap plates to the 50s in order to get a sufficient stimulus, at, you know, at front line. He's doing that. But you've, for anybody who, you know, using a specific muscle like the chest press for your listeners, for anybody who's looking to grow a muscle, it's like how much are you control in that weight? Um, you know, are you are you focusing on just squirming? And again, I know I'm acting this out on the podcast, but squirming it up and you know doing that horrible popping the shoulder out and the traps mm-hmm. coming up and yeah. literally just forcing the weights up by any means possible, or are you focusing on the fact that your pec is actually moving the upper arm upwards and the contraction is coming from the right position? So, provided the form's good, uh, would you agree that then loading needs to take place? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. So you can either do two things. So you can you can regress. So if, say for example, you've been on uh, let's say uh, thirty kilos for eight reps on a flat d- dumbbell bench press, and no matter what, you can't get more than um, f- you can't get more than thirty uh, thirty kilos for eight, and that's just not budged for two three weeks. Hmm. Your first thing you got to do is just look at all the variables outside of Jimmy control. So stress, recovery, sleep, blah, blah, blah. But you should, you know, that's what you guys preach anyway. So your listeners will be aware of that. Yeah. You've got to look at things like, could you in, add an intensifier at a lower intensity? So I'll explain that in a second. That makes the exercise harder. So for example, yeah. if, you're, if you're stuck at 30 for eight, why don't we go back to 24s, 26s, and we'll do 10 to 12 reps, but with a slower tempo. So you're increasing time and attention. You're making it harder. So you've, you've, you've changed the exercise in a sense, not the movement, because you want them to get efficient at the movement, but you've changed variables, the exercise will make it harder. So instead of 30 for eight, we're going to use the 22s for 10 to 12, and we're going to maybe use a four, one, one, one tempo. Now, what you do is you keep that for maybe a couple of weeks. You overload that with perfect form, like you guys are advocates of. And then soon as though that 22s in that exercise has become 26s, and they're getting efficient at doing 26, 
for 12 reps with a 4-1-1 tempo. When you move back to maybe eight reps at a 3 0 one mm. zero tempo, they should all be an equal, be able to do, you know, go up to 30, okay. 30, 34. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So you're basically adding a pause in, slowing the eccentric down a bit more and yeah. being able to dominate a weight before before going yeah, up. Exactly. Yeah. It's control the weight and absolutely nail it, but in a harder setting, but with lighter. Because, you yeah, know... Making light weights feel heavy, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then right. going back to the heavy weights and hope, hoping that the, the transition is yeah, yeah. place. All right, okay, yeah. Because, well, I'd, I'd probably um, approach it from a from actual strength training perspective, even though the goal is hypertrophy, which was you could increase the volume and exposure to the stimulus by increasing the sets. But that's not really something that's kind of... Immediate. Im- yeah. So, you know, for example, if someone's doing three sets of eight on something, they could do four sets of eight, but with a lower weight. So you can increase volume and as a byproduct, you know, because I think that Brad Schoenfield's a big advocate and pretty much everybody who's actually looking into research into hypertrophy is, you know, saying volume is king. Okay, well you say that. What, what would you what would you say? Are you a volume guy or an intensity guy? Because I, I actually disagree with that. I think I think intensity is a key driver of growth. And I think over time, when they say volume increases, they they account for volume as sets types reps times load, right? Mm-hmm. So if you think about it over time, it's just progressive overload anyway. Yeah. Right? And I think yeah. the easiest way to do it is to, to add intensity. It might because you can know there's only an infant it, there's only a finite amount of volume you can add, right? You can't just keep adding volume. Yeah, that, that's that's very true. And I do. Agree. And I think that's where a lot of the people make mistakes when they're trying to build muscles. They use too much volume. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And that's actually that's actually something I go into the third point. But remember, if the problem is they can't lift more, you, if mm. someone's if someone's initial issue is they can't lift more than like thirty kilo dumbbells for eight, then you can't really add intensity unless you went to. Well, know, what for, about what about trying to set PRs at slightly lower weights? So right, so say you hit thirty kilos for eight reps and you're tapped out there. What about recycling it down to twenty five and going for a twelve RM, or looking back at your previous logs and saying, okay, last time I did twenty five kilos, I got eleven reps. This time yeah. I'm trying at twelve or thirteen reps. Yeah. And then when you got up to twenty seven and a half, looking at the previous PR you got you got last time, yeah. and then by the time you hit thirty again, you might actually surpass it. Yeah, one hundred percent. Just just from that, because when you when you recycle the weights, you almost re- reduce some of the fatigue that was previously masking your your strength levels. It's pretty much what you've done with the floor press, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So when we when I said to you, I hit a three rep PR, and you were like, you added three reps in a week. I was like, no, no, no. So what I did is I hit fifty kilos for six, and I, I plateaued on it for three weeks. And instead of just continuing to try hit, you know, trying to get more than six reps, I went back to forty two point five. Um, and for the first week, I stayed well away from failure. So it was almost like a deload. The second week, I started 42.5. And I looked at my previous log, and I tried to beat what I did last time. I ended up getting, I think, 12 or 13 reps. And then I just added 2.5 kilos per week till I got back to 50 kilos. And then when I was with Adam, I said, I'm going for a PB today. And I got nine reps. So I added three reps over that cycle. It took six weeks. Yeah, see, I, I didn't know that he'd cycled it. And he's like, oh, I just got a PB at three reps. And I'm thinking, you've been training like a pussy then for the last... <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you've just suddenly added three reps on in front of me... <laughs> Yeah. And then he explained the noise and over. I was like, ah, right now it makes sense. And now what I've happened is now I've hit, now I've hit 15. I can't get past 50, 50 for nine now. So what I'm thinking, because the problem with the gym I'm at is uh, the fifties are the heaviest dumbbells they have. So the way I'm, the way I'm planning on breaking this, the, the plateau is I'm either going to recycle it again to start at 45 and go up again, or I might do some max sets at 50. So I might do say three sets of six to seven. Mm. So add a bit more volume because it's the only way I can really progress it now. I'm trying to persuade the, the gym owner to get heavier dumbbells and he said he will be getting the 55s, but that might be a bit too much of a jump initially to do more than one set with. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's exactly right. You know, um, I'd, I'd completely agree with that. And something that people kind of underestimate is the power of rinse and repeat. And it's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. It's just like if you've got, say, you've got like a four week block, or you know, in that again, I, I am coming from a strength perspective, but if you've got a four week block and you were able to add maybe 2.5 onto an overhead press for on your five bar M, again, you think, right, well, next week, should I go for five kilos onto what I lifted there? Well, no, just start. So it's hard to do without showing the numbers, but you just start back to week one and say, for example, you were lifting, um, you know, 50 kilos for, for five sets of eight. You know, you might start with 52 for five sets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, 100% right. And you said, yeah, you're talking from a strength block, but essentially when you're building muscle, it is about building strength as well, but it's in a different rep range, right? 
Yeah, I mean, cause so we're just trying to progress in that five to twelve rep range, as opposed to say the one to five, where you're probably focusing a lot of your attention in, right? Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the thing is, the thing that I've uh, one of the biggest, um, most important kind of realizations for me um, is you can't. You've got to be really, really. You've got to look at the big picture. And any bodybuilder who doesn't believe in the importance of getting stronger is missing out on a trick. And any strongman or powerlifter who doesn't believe in the you know the application of higher rep work yeah yeah sure. it's not the trick so look holistically yeah and if you look at the best bodybuilders they're the strongest people right oh, i yeah. mean look at, look at dorian yates look at ronnie coleman they all got super super strong but the problem is people only see what they do now um and they they forget what actually built all the muscle in the first place oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and even with power even with powerlifters and strongman is they do a lot a lot of assistance work and a lot of volume in their in their in their secondary exercises, right? And people don't see that. They only see the heavy one RM lifts. But they don't see the, the 10, 12, 15 rep, you know, sets of leg presses, uh, dumbbell presses that they're all doing to help build the muscle mass. Mm. Yeah, definitely. The smoke and mirrors in a lot of it in the, in the sense of, you know, you've hit the nail on the head there. Like people like, um, for example, John John Meadows now and, and um, Scott Stevenson, you look at their physiques and they might be doing these fancy intricate yeah. movements which are very very small like for the pump but you gotta believe me those guys didn't get to the level of muscle mass they've got through those exercises well yeah i remember seeing i think john meadows put a video of him squatting 600 pounds for five reps back in the day right um so you know you don't yeah. get built. we've we've yeah. spoken about this haven't we akash so. now he yeah. might be squatting 315 but you know back then he was doing yeah. 600 pounds and that's what built a lot of his foundation right and now he can stay lean and and he's, he's got that thickness because he spent 10 20 years Lifting a lot, of, a lot of lifting progressively heavier weight with good form. I still yeah. think that quote from uh, David Johnston is one of the best ones. In your early years, you train DC style, you get strong as fuck until you grind your joints to dust, and then you switch <laughs> over to mountain dog style pump training. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's so it's so true though. Right? It's so true. Hard and heavy, and then as, as you said, you know, once you've accrued that amount of muscle tissue, then mm-hmm. sure, these fancy intricate pump movements. They can work, but it's not going to pack tissue on your frame initially. So, Chris, so there's a follow-on question from that. Um, when you when you're training from that one to five rep range, how would you? What kind of things do you pay attention to more for people who want to get one, stronger in the one to five rep range as opposed to the more traditional hypertrophy rep range? How did that? So, yeah, the answer to that, in my opinion, would be: How did that rep feel? Was it replicable? Did everything feel in tune? So, what I mean is, no, what I mean by the question is, how does the programming change? Oh, programming change. What kind of things do you take into account more often? So, so yeah, basically, um, I think as any as any coach, uh, and again, I don't want to direct this towards coaches because no, it's not demographic, but you basically got to look at periodization in, in a simple way. And the early the early start of any program should be exposure to not a comfortable weight but a weight you can manage mm. with good form and i know it's like people like oh shit the good form thing again you guys you know chill out yeah. on that. you know when I've, I've stood there and i've had dan green say it in a room full of people yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's gone i he was like i don't know i was trying to do that accent but he's like i start with three sets of five at 70 percent and i increase the volume and literally the whole he was like you know if you could hear a cricket chirp um you could and you know if anyone any of your listeners isn't familiar with dan green you know Google him or or, or or you look on his Insta. He's one of the strongest guys in the world, yeah. Yeah, he's strong, one of the strongest powerlifters, but he's also got one of the most impressive physiques. And, you know, he was like, I do three sets of five at 70%, then I add volume, and I just make sure my, my technique is perfect. Um, so, so yeah, from a, from a program design point of view, I, I actually wrote about this the other day where it's, um, say, for example, your 5RM, it, your 5RM should be roughly about 85% of your one rep max. Yeah. Now, arguably, if your goal is body composition and bodybuilding, just forget intensities, forget one rep maxes, because you never, you never really yeah. should. It's not, it's not one, one RMs aren't applicable for anybody whose goal is to get leaner. And, and it, some people will. Act, I'm sure I get slated for that in some respects. But no, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's look at this from from a a reality point of view. The majority of people who come and see you just want to look better. And, you know, if you're, if you've got 12 to 16 weeks with them, the concept of one RM and percentages is, should be, you know, completely yeah. fine. But yeah, if, if you, if you wanted to get stronger and strength is your passion, you want to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate of collect some sort of data. So if you, if you know that your five RM or you did five reps at a weight and it's really tricky. Uh, so your five RM on a bench press is, is, is hundred kilos. Then you just work at 
like maybe 15 to 10 percent lower intensities for high volume and then just linearly drop the volume yeah. okay good yeah good. so you so would you say this is probably way, way ahead of for a lot of people but would you say you kind of I'm want to bring to, it back in a minute <laughs> yeah <laughs> would you say yeah because i'm getting <laughs> i'm getting into this uh would you um, say you're more into linear periodization or do you kind of dive into the more conjugate West Side style training? <laughs> right. Um, I, I, conjugate, I would have to train really fucking hard for another five years before conjugate was applicable to me. Okay, so I'm glad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'll, I'll leave so You still there. rinse and repeat the kind of linear per, periodization that kind of Ed Cohen made popular. Yeah. You know, you start at, say, 70% and you slowly come down in reps and uh, increase the intensity. Yeah. And, and you know, and to, to bring it back in, because obviously, you know, I know what, you guys are trying to get from this podcast which is content for your listeners and um, if you listen to this and want to get stronger the conjugate system is is you know that bit in friends where joey's like the line is a dot to you that's how far away that is that 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 the conjugate system yeah, yeah. of your listeners is that you know you don't need to be researching that so to bring it back what i what i will say is um how, how i apply and i thought to you this about the other day is um how we apply this to um body composition would be to start a program light with reps in the tank mm. and then as you progress through six to eight weeks slowly ramp the intensity up get closer and closer to failure and then when you do reach that week where you're hitting failure those are the weeks where you want to go for all-time pbs and then you might back cycle the weight slightly and then carry on mm -hmm. that's the way it applies for that's essentially linear periodization basically and that's yeah. the way to apply it for bodybuilding and body composition uh, goals yeah yeah I, I i couldn't agree more with that i mean the basics win which you know, I think that we come, every, everyone comes full circle in this industry. And, you know, when I first started off, um, you know, however long ago, you know, you think there's this like elixir of, of one day I'll come across the magical program that gets people. To, and there is yeah, a secret, yeah. there's a secret to doing it. And I need to do this. And the reality is to anybody is that a basic program will work as long as you're consistent with it and do it yeah. right. But, you know, it, it, it doesn't really... Tying it full circle, eh? Right in time. Yeah, exactly. So, like, Consistency you, always wins, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what it is. And, and, and it's, it's a frustrating because, you know, you don't want to listen to podcasts where, they go, where you go, oh, it's the consistency thing again. But the fact of the matter is, is that unless real plateaus are very... are, are quite It's rare. very rare unless you're super advanced, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, definitely. And, um, and that comes from speaking to some of the best coaches in the world, you know, yeah. um, and, 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 and interviewing them. And, and they, you know, when they, are, and a very, very distinct plateau is, um, they have to approach it in a different way, which is why I initially answered the question with, well, it depends who it's for. Um, and, and you've got to look at, and Paul Carter wrote a fantastic article about this is that, you know, say a client has been absolutely leathering it, like nailing it for the for about you know four weeks, five weeks. They've been on everything. They're about to come into a session with you, and they check their email and an account that they were supposed to close, or a, you know, a deal that was going to go through falls through just before the session, and they've got this mental stress and they're away with the fairies. You've got to look at the fact: is that is it the program and everything that you've designed, or is it some like the psychological effect of stress? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going to impact their progression which is huge because an athlete has a different mentality towards training than a guy who's doing three times a week to look bad you know with his shirt off yeah that's a great point so on that note what, what kind of tips would you give for say the busy corporate executive who has you know 10 other things on their mind when they're training or when they go into their session well that's the funny thing is that people who you know in my, my demographic now on a one-to-one -one basis is is exactly that the guys with you know, who are, who are the lawyers or they, they work, um, they've got multiple businesses. And to be honest, it depends on what they're like. The, the, the number-driven ones do care about what they live. But then some, I, I found that the business owners, the people who have a million things going through the mind, don't care about that because it's another variable that they'd have to worry about. I could hand them the same weights and they could have been doing it for six weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could say, oh, you've hit a PB today. And they'd be like, all right, that's cool. They just want a time to switch off. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's distracting. And, you know, if you turn around to them, because I've done it before where, you know, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a magical strength coach, but I've said like, I might have had somebody who started with 10 kilos on a shoulder press and by the end of the 12 weeks they did 18s. And I've turned around and showed them my, my laptop and be like, oh, look at this. And they've gone, yeah, they don't care. <laughs> they don't give a shit. You know, it depends. It, it, it all depends on what I do. And sometimes the thing as coaches you know, you, you hit the nail on the head where you said you've got to give a shit and you want it more than them, but you can't override your passion for someone's progress if it's not there for them. Yeah. And 
if you know you you're lucky when you've got someone who's completely zoned in on body composition that's like a golden egg like fantastic but you're even more fortunate if you get someone who wants to get stronger because you know, at the end of the day like i say 99 percent of the people who come through the door just want to look better yeah i think it's exciting right when you go when you get both oh yeah 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 well i've got a funny one because i've got a lawyer who um who who came to me for weight loss and he's really he's, he's very strong now but he hasn't lost any weight, so <laughs> he's actually yeah. really, he just wants to get stronger. Which I'm like, okay, fair enough. Let's get strong. So let's uh, switch gears away from training. So this one is <laughs> applicable. No, Adam didn't say a word in that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, oh, geez, just 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 pick it up, just get stronger. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, gut health. So you've mentioned that that this is one of your passions. You know, you've been through it yourself. Um, what are your, what are the most common issues that you see amongst your clients? And what are some simple sort of remedies that you sort of see across the board? So I know obviously the gut can be really intricate and there's you know, very individualized, but are there common patterns that you see? Yeah. So before I go into this, I, I think this is, this is a prescriptive that I wanted to say um, is that I think you've got to respect as a trainer that where, what your jurisdiction is. <laughs> so doing a course, reading a book does not make you, a, a fucking digestive specialist. I have people who I work with whose job, who've done 10 years and you have PhDs in dealing with this who I refer out. So the first thing I'd say is that I study to be able to get a concept of things. And then once it's past my capabilities of understanding, I refer out. And I just wanted to say that because I think there's a misconception of trainers who do a one day course, which I'm not going to name. And then they suddenly become endo- endocrinologists. Yeah, you, know. you need you need to know your pay grade. Yeah, exactly, one hundred percent. But coming from that is how, what can I learn that I'm able to apply in an everyday setting? So I just have a very uh, I have a questionnaire, and it's uh, it comes up with with symptoms of, of poor digestion, and then that will score it for me, and I'll look, and it'll give a section that may be a main priority. Now, nine times out of ten, a main one of the top three priorities. Uh, that comes up is um, low stomach acid, um, which I'm sure you guys will have, have found as well. Now, does that mean you need to take stomach acid? So I did. I give the again, I let listeners a, a breakdown: is that you eat your food, food goes into the stomach, it requires stomach acid to break it down. It's that simple. Stress, um, eating, eating very quickly, uh, deficiencies, smoking, alcohol can deplete stomach acid, which means that the food can either sit in your stomach or it doesn't get broken down properly, you don't get the nutrients properly. Low stomach acid is 100% the most common thing I find. And it doesn't matter where, um, how good you can have the best nutritionist on the planet who gives the best macro split or the most organic foods. If your stomach acid is very, very low and it's not getting broken down sufficiently. <laughs> so I, uh, have all my ethos is that always look at free remedies that can be done through habit before supplementation now the jury's out because i've worked with i've worked some excellent um gut health specialists do you need to supplement with hcl yeah yeah possibly that could be an issue but even hcl even supplementation won't do anything if somebody is literally necking the food at 100 miles an hour mm. so you've got to <laughs> yeah. That, yeah that's that's me yeah and it's such a it's such a simple tip is that you've got to look at the lifestyle as an executive and and um, again again this is prescriptive because it's something I wanted to explain but what we what Akash and I spoke about the other day was was uh, the theory of things and the reality of things so theory and reality on a continuum and everything that you're going to be kind of dealing with is right in the middle of that continuum yeah. so theory is low stomach acid supplement with stomach acid to um, improve it. The reality is, is that that's not going to make a difference if somebody is getting up, having a coffee, they are then uh, eating a cereal bar in the car or or they're eating like um, a protein shake while they're getting the tube. They're then going to run out, get a sandwich and a packet of crisps and a Diet Coke, eat that on the way back to the office. And then they're not actually going to sit down and enjoy a meal until the evening when they have like a carbonara and some meatballs or something like that. So... I'll break it down very, very simply in terms of the digestive system for for your listeners, because it might be cool, but I, I do not want to sound overly scientific to stroke my own ego. Let's just look at this very, very simply. Your digestive system or your body works in two ways. So you've got your sympathetic nervous system, your parasympathetic nervous system. And that just basically means 
on and off. Let's just call it as simple as that. Go, fast paced, calm down, relaxed. Now, digestion comes from uh, is very very is very um, much associated with the parasympathetic nervous system, which is calm environment. So you want to be digesting food in a calm state where you're relaxed, so your body can solely focus on breaking that food up, assimilating it, and and, and getting it. So when you are on the go constantly, um, you kind of mitigating that effect. You're not getting that proper breakdown of food. Uh, which massively can it can cause other digestive implications, which again I won't go into because it's a bit like too detailed. But it's, it's simple things as as you know, time management is something I go on about a lot. And if you wake up 15, 20 minutes earlier, so you can have 15 minute window to sit and chew your food, mm. and maybe do something that stimulates the digestive system beforehand, properly digest it, maybe have five minutes of just sitting down and not doing anything before you go. These have huge effects, like massive, massive effects. You know, and we bang on as personal trainers about the importance of protein and the importance of like carb timing and fats and everything. But at the end of the day, all that's irrelevant if it's not getting into your system. So yeah, I'd say the number one thing in terms of digestion is is low stomach acid. And the implications of that are, are, are basically um, you just need to chew your food more, be more mindful, be more relaxed when you eat. And every no, I think those three tips are great, and I think those will solve a lot of common issues, right? Would you agree, Adam? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you yeah. something you've experienced yourself, and um, you always, yeah, yeah. Whenever I slow my my uh, chewing down, as funny as it sounds, you know, I, I'm I don't repeat my meals as much. I'm less yeah. bloated for sure. Um, and I remember when I was talking to a, uh, somebody that specialised in digestion, she was just she looked at me just like, deadpan and was just like, "Your stomach doesn't have teeth." What do you expect? <laughs> She's like, That's what your teeth are for in your mouth. She's like, just yeah. chew it. <laughs> yeah, the, the um, I can't remember who said it, but it was like, you've got to be able to drink your food and by the end of it, um, you, by the end of it, you can, um, you, you should, I think it's like 32 times. I know it's like funny, but this is going to annoy so many people. It's Nelly the Elephant. <laughs> you, really? You, you yeah. 32 beats and, and sometimes, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's weird it sounds. You go through that in your head. And that's the yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you swallow, and that's that is, and it's huge. It plays, you know, if someone has something like, um, if someone, so you've got to look at symptom and causation. So symptom might be belching, bloatedness, fatigue, and that's come from you know not digesting your food properly. And the dealing with the symptom would be right. Let's whack you on a load of HCL and see what happens. Yeah, that might work. It might help. But all you're doing is you're, um, you're, looking, you're, you're fixing a symptom. The causation is actually you're not, you've got a habit which is causing you to, to with these digestive problems. Mm-hmm. But you can give someone a free tip, which you know doesn't cost anything to eat slower. It's just time management, which it all, all it boils down to. And I'd say for you know, if, if your demographic based on what you told me is that if you want to maximize muscle growth, energy output, mental clarity, maximize your digestion, if you want to maximize your digestion, the simplest thing is just to properly, you know, chew your food. Chew your food yeah. Simple as that. Well, what were, sorry, what were the um, digestive issues that you went through? Like, oh, right, right. Okay. Just so, very uh, simply. Yeah, very simply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, I um, had an active social life when I was at uni. Let's leave it there. And um, that caused some issues <laughs> with, um, I didn't have liver issues but it just meant my gallbladder wasn't um as um efficient as it as it was and um, okay. when your gallbladder isn't working as well as it should you you can have a symptom can be poor assimilation of fats mm-hmm. you, don't, you can't you can't um break down and absorb fats properly it can lead to other issues uh, because obviously you know that you need fats for you know hormone production um and it, it, there are there are other symptoms that, that come from it, which um, you know I'm actually doing a, another a seminar explaining all this. But it was just I, I was I had very poor sleeping patterns. I was waking up at three o'clock all the time, and I couldn't get back to sleep. My training was poor. Um, you know, I'd, I was getting very lethargic. So I, I went and saw a guy called Steve Grant, who's based in London. And if you do have any affluent clientele who who are, have very poor stomach ish, uh, digestive issues. He's fantastic. And I worked with him for a period of time in 2015. He educated me about what the issue was. And um, we used some supplementation, some nutritional protocols to, to correct it. Uh, and once you've got that education, 
become aware of it. So, for example, if I have a high fat meal, I'll always supplement with ox bile. Or I was about to ask if you use their ox bile. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Uh, that's even now, even if I've got good, you know, even if I'm good health. If I'm having a meal where I know I'm exceeding anywhere between 80 to 100 grams of fat, which which does happen, um, then that that um, then I will continue to use that. So don't obviously don't go into like specifics and dosages or anything like that. Um, because it is into individual, but what are the core supplements for digestion that um, Steve recommended for you? So see, oh, Oxbar would be one of them. So for those that don't know, that's helping sort of the gallbladder issue in terms of digesting fats. Yeah, it was, um, it was, right. was it probiotics? Uh, no, pre- no, anything no. like that? Like digestive enzymes? Like just a break. As I said, like this is something you've paid for. It's individual oh, to no, you. No, 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 no. So if I had, Oh, right. Um, if you can talk amongst yourselves, I'll see if I still got it on my laptop. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> no. Yeah. And then, oh, Jesus, let me just, I'm just going to have all my files, Steve. I, because I, I'm, I'm very similar to you guys where I don't, I have no um, kind of thing about holding things back. You know, if people want to know, oh, is that it? No. Um, yeah, it'd just be interesting just to see kind of what the general. So. And if there's any supplements in there that like I haven't heard of, for example, that I could perhaps. Uh, look into myself yeah so i'm just to see if it's on the laptop um thing might render my name yeah so basically it was there was definitely got goal plus in there which is a fantastic one if you have poor um uh poor uh, symptoms of poor fat uh, uh not being able to digest fat uh right um and i think it is in here somewhere because it's it, bearing in mind that he gave it to me um a few years ago, so I'm going deep into something. Uh, right, so I haven't got it, but off the top of my head, it was it was definitely was NAC, which is N acetylcysteine, which is it's his liver support. I think there was another. Um, there's one from I think Designs for Health called LVGB, which is a which is a, a, a multiple um, support as well. There's one which. You might know Adam from Anabolic Designs, which I can't remember. Is it something like it might not be Anabolic Designs, but it might be Redcon? But there's something called like Nectar. What's it? Are you familiar with it? Uh, I've heard of Nectar. The the digestive supplement with uh, Project AD is uh, Ravenous. No, it's not Ravenous. No, it was basically I'll, I'll just say it straight. There was a, there was a supplement that came out which you read it and you go, wow, okay, that's designed for somebody using a lot of PEDs because it's heavy liver support. Uh-huh. If you go on that, uh, if you if you any type of liver support. Um, it was just it was just those protocols. So I think off the top of my head, I don't know if it was dandelion root. I don't think it was that. Um, I, don't, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but there was just a lot of gold bile support, a lot of liver support. Um, I think there's a massive misinterpretation of pro- probiotics and what they do. Okay. Um, and I think that um, it's one of the things that I want to teach the people who come to seminar is that what people assume is good for the gut is actually can can actually be the opposite so yeah to, to answer your question let's just go with it was definitely gold plus or an ox bile which is just bile and um, it was nac which is a, which is a liver support and there is one more which i can't remember but if i do I'll, I'll if i find it i'll email it to you yeah just kind of interesting to uh so what are you, let's uh just segue into the probiotics then just in a don't give away too much of your seminar content but um give us like a couple of bullet points, bullet points are where, where are people going wrong where where people are going wrong is that the so so the, the whole thing about my seminars in regards to like any type of mobility screen or gut health screening is that it's not necessarily what you do it's being aware of what's going on that's the main thing you know you I said there's a hundred ways to skin a cat and how you help someone is completely up to you let's look at have you identified what's what the issue is now in, in a certain case where somebody's got a um, say you've got a field and it's um, really it's got very fertile. Uh, fertile soil everything's fine it's all good to go and you to fertilize it put something on it like spray it with seeds and then you know you're going to have loads of crops which which are all going to is what you want but what if you had like a, a field which was covered in pesticides there's loads of crap everywhere and there may be like certain things that need digging out first you need to first of all just um weed everything and get rid of it and this is a concept which comes from bob Rakowski who's a functional medicine um, practitioner in, in, in the States, which is the weed seed feed protocol. And if you look at that, people will fall in different categories of you might need to keep them in a weed state for a while, then the feed state, 
um, than the seed one. Weed seed and feed. Oh, sorry, weed seed and feed. So it's basically getting rid of all the crap. That's phase one. Mm-hmm. Um, planting seed that's going to um, give you like crops or basically give gut health, good gut health, and then feed and then promoting the, a good gut health environment. So probiotics are actually a feeding stage. They're going to improve, you know, if, if the state of someone's gut if it's already healthy. So are you saying that you need to remove the bad stuff, then maybe use prebiotics to feed your own gut flora and then, right. Okay. And so for, for those listening, like prebiotics are like a precursor to producing your own yeah. probiotics. Yeah. So pre, prebiotics is basically like a, a this, yeah, exactly what you said, a precursor. So, so if you, if you're, so let's, let's, let's give, give this to you dem- demographic in a simple way. So you think you have poor digestion or you think you have a gut health issue. You go on, uh, the internet you google uh, google digestion it says you need to take probiotics probiotics great probiotics are great deadlifts are great should everyone deadlift that type of thing so think of it like that mm. no you've um you so somebody's so i'm going to take probiotics because probiotics are going to improve my gut issue now if somebody didn't have adequate gut flora which was good for them yeah probiotics would be good but if somebody's got something like a bacterial overgrowth, which is very common, um, uh, or they've got a, a more intricate or bacterial infection, taking probiotics is like putting that on steroids. So it's you've just basically gone, here you go, there's something that's going to feed it. You've given it a load of bacteria, um, and the bacteria can actually have a, a negative impact. So And glutamine as well. You know, <laughs> If you say to any coach or personal trainer, name your top three, gut health um supplements probiotics and glutamine are going to probably going to get featured in there but yep. if you introduce them at the wrong stage that can have ad- you know massively adverse effects on them um so like i said the, the whole point of my seminars isn't to say right this is my methods this is the gospel truth go out and do it and everyone will be fine that's not what it is it's identify where someone is figure out what you perceive the issue to be and then figure out what what level of intervention you need to do that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. Perfect. Let's um, let's start wrapping this up. Yeah. Throw away from sort of the training, the gut talk. Your uh, your seminars. You delivered your first one recently, right? Yep. How did it go? Talk us through it. Like, what was it on? Where do you see this going now, long term? Give give the listeners kind of a yeah. the lowdown on how you see this going. The, the educational that, side of things. The, the educational side of things is it's just a natural progression. I mean. I've done a lot of further learning and it's not a case of, right, I've learned it all, I need to apply it. That couldn't be further from the truth. I'll probably do twice as many seminars this year as I deliver myself and probably even more. And I've already booked, you know, on on several coming up. It's more a case of, it's more about enjoyment. I love to research and I love to read about new things. And I'm a type of person who the more I, I I learn by applying it myself and um, even though I'm, I'm a little bit of an introverted character, I get a real buzz out of being not center of attention, but be, you know, you guys would be able to relate to it. You know, when you're up there and, and you're talking, it, you know, it gives you a bit of a kick. And it's the same thing when it comes to competing and, and things like that is that when it's go time, it's fun. And um, the whole thing about the, the seminars is that I want more than anything is just to give the, give the people who attend value. Um, when I've been to seminars before where, and again, I, I, I thoroughly loved yours and it's why I'm such an advocate of what you guys do. I'm not just saying that, but sometimes you'll know this as well. You go to a seminar and you might pay a couple hundred pounds to do it. Um, they try and baffle you with, with either too much science. So you think you've, you've got, mm. cause it's very advanced. Yeah. You take away from it and it's like, right, can I actually, apply what can it? you actually, it, it, precisely every seminar Akash and I do, we always kind of recap over it and it's like right what's the take-home message what is the the applicable bit you know yeah. rather than as you say just give all this theory mm. let's give you the theory but then let's wrap it up this is how we actually apply it with clients this is what yeah. we do and that's what i think makes you know a, a good seminar stand out personally is uh, like you uh, we're not, we're not going to name him but do you remember the one that we attended in uh, london together yeah, yeah. Uh, back when you first started it was about contest prep yeah, uh, I mean, put it this way. I fell asleep mm. genuinely like towards the afternoon. I drifted off and we left about an hour early and it was yeah. like, what do we take from that? The problem is it's so easy just to like, put a seminar on and sound smart, right? Yeah, I mean... It's different between actually applying it in the real world. Let, let's look at it this way, right? And, I, and, and 
I, I, I don't want, want to sound like uh, or being malicious towards other people. It's not that, but it's knowing your role as a personal trainer, unless you are going to graduate to functional medicine or unless you're going to do a master's in endocrinology or, or, or bi biochemistry, what the fuck are you doing putting a, a, a you know, a, a diagram of the Krebs cycle on the board with, with long chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's going to go over people's heads at the end of the day. You know, if you wanted to go on about sulforaphane and fucking a metabolism of X, Y, Z, you can say eat broccoli. It means the exact same fucking thing. You know, I don't, I yeah, don't, we're we're with you one hundred percent. Remember we went to on remember we um, that weekend we came in on a Monday where we used to work and everyone went to this seminar that I think did the Krebs cycle thing and then everyone was talking about the Krebs cycle and the TCA cycle the same thing right TCA cycle glycogen analysis mitochondria and yes yeah, the like, basic the basic underlying the underlying point was do some more cardio. Well, yeah, exactly. yeah yeah <laughs> that's what it is and i said to people on um i said to people on the course that i did with you which was on it was just a screening system and i say that really relaxed like it's a screening system is that basically the people who attended the, the course that i did it was this is the screening system that i use when someone comes through the door and the reason why i use it is because um i don't want them to sign up with me literally you know you, you do you do the transaction you do a little questionnaire and then you go in the gym floor. I think that's wrong. I think you need to understand what a person's doing. So you're looking at the overhead squat test. You're looking at isolation movements and, and the joint range of motion. And what I was saying to the people who attended is that this is technically your first session. How does this person move? What's the coordination like? Do they have any injuries? And it's so you don't get somebody. And like we were speaking about the other day, Akash, you don't get somebody and go, right, okay, now let's do a high bar Olympic back squat where you have to sit on your balls. You know, it's like, mm. you know, you might... You know, you, you, that's that's not going to happen for nine out of ten people. So yeah. you've got to identify your entry level, and it's why there's actually a, a structural backbone to all my all my educational content, which is um, it's identification of ident uh, entry levels, and that's it. Where do where do I need to start someone with a diet and digestive support? Where do I need to start somebody with their um, exercise selection, which is safe? You know, safety for me is above all everything, you know, you, if somebody, so for example, I know and people can't, people can't see this, but you, you know, you guys can, if somebody doesn't have full range of external rotation, in the shoulder, it just gets stuck. And external rotation is be able to kind of rotate your arm backwards. If it's level in the, in the position of bench press, if that's compromised and on both sides. Like it's, it's like half of what it should be. You know, and someone comes into you and says, I want a big chest. Let's bench press. And you go, yeah, let's do that. You're ingrained in a pattern that where somewhere down the line, no matter what, somewhere down the line, there's going to be either a shoulder impingement or an injury. That's a fact. Um, so you need to identify, right, okay, this person's not a level where they can bench press yet. Let's do some either more, more um, thorough warm-ups. Let's do maybe some program design, which is going to correct the issue. Let's do some more stretching, maybe a remedial phase for, you know, any two to four weeks. And then let's get them bench pressing. So yeah, it's it's more stuff that it's going to be it makes things safer for the client because a safe client is a happy client and th it gives them more longevity. They'll stick with you because the one thing I said to the people there is that you know a client who can get a more um, thorough service, it, it, you're actually saving them money. So if you, you can injury prevent people, you're saving them money on sick days, back low back problems, mm -hmm. you know issues that they may have to invest later. In. Yeah. yeah. So, How can uh, people sign up to your seminars? Uh, just follow me on Instagram, plug, <coughs> you know, things like, <laughs> just, just go, go on, plug yourself. Yeah, we, yeah, we need, we want you to do it. So yeah, what's your yeah, yeah. Instagram handle? If you, if you follow, um, just follow me on Instagram, I'll, I'll be posting about what it. What is your Instagram? It's, 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 it's going to be hard to remember. It's Chris underscore not underscore. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it's it's there, and um, you know, people people will come, uh, and uh, it's it's the most relaxed thing. And I'm I'm not just saying this for, you know, for the sake of it. Is that um, in 20 years time? What I know now, in 20 years time, I think, oh my god, I didn't know anything. And it's a continual learning process, yeah. and it's. And I don't want to say I lose power by saying it's an open floor, but I'll start the seminar by saying if you disagree with anything or you don't think that's right, just put your hand up and we'll chat about it. And it's not like calling you out. It's like, let's discuss this because, you know, uh, I think I introduced, uh, did the introduction in our podcast, uh, Akash, where I said, this industry is filled with people calling people out saying, you know, oh, such a body this and such about this. You know, why don't we just try and help each other and, and, um, and improve each other's services? 
You know, because if you're confident in what you do and you have a good service, you shouldn't be worried about what other people are doing. Yeah, hundred percent. The mindset in the fitness industry. Yeah, yeah it's sad. Sure it's sad. Um, so, what is so for the next seminar? It's uh, April. April the fourteenth. It's at the Footline Fit Performance Center. If you uh, quote um, RNT Fitness, you get a free coffee off Rayhan. So. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to put that in there just to see if anyone does it and be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. and, what's, and what's this seminar on? The, yeah, the, the one in April. On, it's on digestive health. It's going to be a series of little talks that I'll be doing on what I spoke about today, uh, yep. digestive health, um, some protocols and what to do. Uh, very, you know, it's then it's going to be a little bit about macros, but pretty much everyone in attendance will be familiar with that. Mm. And then it's going to be a bit on uh, compliancy and again, the reality of things of yeah, sending people macros in a six meal a day plan is how to get them to stick to it and who will and who won't stick to it. Yeah. Cool. So wrap it up. Um, you're big on productivity. You're big on time management. You're a busy guy. You know, you've got your podcast, you're writing this hundred thousand word thing. You're reading all these books. Yeah. what do you do to switch off oh right <laughs> i mean do you switch off or is your version of switching off to continue yeah. educating yourself so this is the moment where people will be like fucking hell i didn't see that coming but i've got um a little four-year-old girl who takes up so what? much <laughs> i didn't even know you had... I didn't... you got so, a kid yeah well no it's my my, my fiance it's 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 my stepdaughter and she yeah is like from so basically everything that you see me do online is done between the hours of seven and three because at three o'clock when you know it's time to pick her up it's then it's um it's then paw patrol peter rabbit and and um i should know this off so it just it basically just it's it's time with her and she's relentless she's fucking relentless so you know it, it it once once she's in the house it you know there's no time for work there's no nothing like that so my day is switched between on mode and you know lifting you know deadlifting acting like a tough guy and then you know paying having tattoos and you know, the uh, glitter tattoos and making cupcakes in the afternoons <laughs> so, uh, so, your, so your work day is between seven and three it, it, no i do i do work later on in the day um I've, I've had to extend pt hours uh, for, for the next few months just just for um, because I have the opportunity to, but yeah. um, no, I, I, I do uh, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. I try to finish it too, but it's looking like for the next few months that, that I will be working later. But yeah, I switch off with family time. I, I, if yeah. unless it's family time, I, I'll be working, and I'm fine with that because I love I, I love what I do. So just out of interest to me, how how do you structure your day right now in terms of uh, your writing, your training, your PT? Like, talk us through a, a, a quick example day. Okay, so um, PT wise, I've got um, like five clients who do three to four times a week, and I try and get the majority done in the morning. So it'll be like someone at seven, uh, someone at nine, someone at ten. Then I'll train them two in the evening, so five a day. Okay, um, on a day that I'm in later. Um, sometimes I'll be starting earlier. Um, what I do is that it will depend. It really, it really does depend. So I've got a little notepad, and the day before, I'll sit down and I'll write down um, my day, literally hour by hour. Right. So that's actually yeah. even tougher, you know, than uh, typically with time management is you establish a routine. Yeah. You, it sounds like you don't have a routine. No, I don't have a routine. Okay. That's, that's actually even harder. So uh, respect yeah. to you for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you've just got to be, you've got to protect the time that you're doing. And, and when you've come and, um, you know, when it comes down to it, you can't be flicking through Instagram or social media. Even though I do that, I 100% do that loads, but I'll do that when I have time to. But, you know, if this hour is you've got to write 600 words, I've got to fucking write 600 words. That's, that's, the, it's, that's it. It's, it doesn't, yeah. How it works. So. Perfect. I think it was a great, uh, great podcast. This is a cool chat. We got, you know, Akash got his little fix with the, <laughs> The training side of it. I got mine with the nutrition and gut health. We got some psychology in there. I think yeah, it's a yeah. pretty good uh, all-round episode. Thank you. No, thank you. Anything to finish on, Akash? No, let's wrap it up with our usual plugs. Let's go for <laughs> it. Over to you. At, at RNT underscore fitness. At you can't, you can't just go into just giving them the handles. You've got to ask them to follow us. you got to thank them for listening. you got to okay, warm thanks. them up. <laughs> we all know for an hour and a half. <laughs> Okay, thanks for listening, guys. Follow us on Instagram at rnt, RNT underscore fitness at Akash Regala or at Adam Haley one or 
our website, which is www.rncfitness.co.uk. If you're enjoying the episodes, please hit subscribe. And if you're feeling extra generous, leave us a review. Thank you. <laughs> Very well done. I liked it. <laughs> one, one take. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, right. Thanks again, Chris. We'll speak to you soon and we'll see you uh, April the 1st. Three weeks time, yeah. Yeah, nice one, guys. See you soon. Great. Take care. Bye.